Good afternoon and welcome to this special Facebook Live event hosted by the Army G1 and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston. Today, the Army G1 Senior Enlisted Advisors and the Sergeant Major of the Army will discuss key changes to the Army Regulation 670-1 and announce significant changes to the Army Grooming Standard. Throughout the event, we're gonna take questions from you in the audience, uh, both here in the Pentagon Auditorium and online. So make sure you get those questions into the uh, chat box below. And then here in the room, we have a microphone set up. Uh, come stand behind, socially distance, of course. And we'll do that throughout the event as possible. Uh, so we'll get to as, as many of those as we can, but let's go ahead and get started. I'm Sergeant First Class Will Rainier. I'll be co-moderating today's discussion. And I'm Sergeant First Class Evans. Please help me welcome our panel today. Um, so from Army G1, we have the policy branch Star Major, Star Major Brian Sanders. From Army G1 Star Major, we have Star Major Clark. And gentlemen, please help me welcome Star Major, Star Major of the Army, SMA Grinston. We'll open the floor for opening remarks from Star Major Grinston. really wanted to take time to look at this. This is really good for our Army. So I'm 
really excited about today. And this is how we put people first. We go, we go here from you know our soldiers, and we took a look at that, and then we looked at this and said, hey, there's some changes that we need to make. But change doesn't just happen overnight, so it takes some time. Some people really embrace change, some people don't. So it is a change, so I really look forward to the discussion today. But I really want to thank the hard work of the G1 team. So the G1 put the panel together for the Army. Uh, we had soldiers on the panel, so I thank all the panel members. I also want to really thank um, the, not just the panel members, uh, but also uh, the soldiers that brought forward those recommendations. So a lot of hard work uh, to get to this point. Um, yep. They looked at all the recommendations. and. Oh, I'm going to stop you right here, SMA. It looks like your microphone is not transmitting out. If we can get that in the booth. Uh, we're getting comments that uh, his microphone's not transmitting out on the stream. Testing, testing. Hello? Hello? Can I hear you, Sergeant Major? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? They can't hear me, so. Okay, let's okay. audible this. <laughs> Step away from the podium. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is going to, it's going to be great. Can you hear me? Uh, somebody type a great, I know you can hear me in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens, you know, when you're Sergeant Major in the Army, everybody's got to make jokes. Of course I can hear you, Sergeant Major, I'm sitting right here. So. I'm hoping everyone out in Facebook Live can actually hear me now. We'll, we'll kind of work from here and see how this goes. So I really appreciate it. You missed my excitement in the beginning. I'm still <laughs> excited about all these changes. So we're really excited about the changes that are coming up. And I wanted to thank the G1 team and the soldiers that came to do the panel, the G1, the soldiers that made those recommendations to the panel, made them to us as the senior leaders. We said, hey, put this panel together. Thanks for all those folks that involved this uh, to get us to this point so we can roll these things out. So we looked at the recommendations. Um, the panel made those recommendations to the senior leaders, and we said, yeah, these are great. And that's what we're going to roll out today. So I'm excited about doing this. And But I just have to remind everybody, with any good policy, it really uh, boils down to good leaders, too. So once we change the standards, we just got to make sure everybody knows about them. That's where we're giving plenty of time to talk about these things. But um, without leadership, any policy is not as good as it should be until we actually get the leaders to understand what this policy means. So um, leadership still matters. We have, to, we have to have time to say, here's what our standards are, and that's what uh, we're going to talk about today. We have to know it. We have said it. And then ultimately, we'll enforce the standards. And that's what's uh, great about our Army. And said, well, this is just what we do. And these aren't about male and female this is about an Army standard and how we move forward with the Army and being a more diverse, inclusive team. We take recommendations from our soldiers and then we move forward with those uh, recommendations. So again, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Yasme Grinston. We have a lot to discuss today, so let's get started. On or about February 26th, the Army will publish the updated AR670-1. Sergeant Major Clark, what can soldiers expect from this new update? All right, uh, thank you, Sergeant Evans, for the question. So um, today at 1600, um, you will be able to go to the Army Publishing Directorate um, to download the new AR 670-1 and DAPAM 670-1. Um, but I, I want to preface uh, my statements before I get into what's going to be in there with uh, there's going to be 30 days before that regulation becomes effective. The purpose behind that is to allow for soldiers and leaders to read through the regulation, provide an understanding and to make sure that their commands and soldiers are aware of the policy changes that, are, that will be made. And then it gives the organization 30 days to get within compliance of the new guidance that will be within uh, the regulation. So some of the big changes that you will see in there, um, as you know, we've, uh, we are now wearing the Army Green Service uniform. So some guidance that we've been working on since June of 2019 will finally be published um, for you to be able to read and enforce within your organizations. Another big change that you will see is the soldier sleeve insignia uh, for former wartime service, formerly or normally called the combat patch. 
The name has now changed to the Soldier Sleeve Insignia uh, for Military Operations in Hostile Conditions. And one of the big rationales behind that change was for us to allow commanders more flexibility and efficiency in the process for recognizing soldiers who are engaged in combat operations uh, that can be recognized uh, with a, a uh, combat patch. Uh, some other things that we're also going to add is we created an insignia for the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So things like that, big ticket items, you will see those items um, in the publication of the AR670-1. Great. And in addition to that, Sergeant Major Clark, uh, we are also authorizing more options for nursing mothers uh, combined with the temporary promotion policy that we unveiled uh, just a few months ago. Um, really excited to see these changes for our Army moms. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So uh, what we will now authorize is for uh, soldiers who are breastfeeding to be able to wear a specialized shirt under their Army combat uniform um, that allows for them to breastfeed. They will also be authorized to remove their um, Army combat uniform coat or if they are in ASU's uh, dress mess uniform or the Army uh, Green Service uniform, they can remove the top um, in order to um, breastfeed their children um, if they need to do so. Great, thank you. SMA, you mentioned that the there was a panel that had convened, uh, and so I want to just learn more about this panel and understand uh, that. So Sergeant Major Sanders, that was kind of one of your uh, main tasks in this entire process. So can you help us just understand what that process looked like, how we uh, developed these recommendations, how they were given to the panel, and just really the entire process so we can understand uh, how all this kind of came to be? Roger, Roger. So uh, I will tell you, you know, initially when the SMA gave me this guidance, I thought it was an impossible task of how to make this significant change for the Army. Like, how do I figure this out? Uh, so, you know, the SMA, he gave some direction of, uh, of utilizing our, you know, our MAGCOM CSMs to get, you know, a lot of, you know, representation, a very diverse representation from throughout our force, that being FORCECOM, TRADOT, USASOC, USAREC, and, and a myriad of other uh, elements that are out there, as well as grabbing subject matter experts from Walter Reed, Office of the Surgeon General, and even MedCom. Uh, so what we were able to do, there were some uh, recommendations that I have been receiving from the field for over the past six months to a year. And what I was able to do is provide these recommendations uh, to, the, you know, to the, the, uh, the panel members that were given to us from these major commands, as well as give to the subject matter experts. And what they were able to do is really explore, deep dive, uh, really look at, you know, how, how can we get after these and see, you know, make the appropriate modifications if necessary? Uh, really just to sum it up a little bit. Okay, and then uh, SMA, those recommendations were consolidated and provided to you. Can you speak to what kind of happened after that? I, I do want to back up about the panel and how important that was. What we didn't want to do is, is take recommendations throughout the Army and just give it to you know, I'd say the more senior folks in the Army and look at it, because we look at it differently. So it was really important for me and for all of us to have people on the panel that were some, you know, I'm a little over 50, not much, but um, to have, you know, younger soldiers to say, here's our recommendation. So we had 24 year olds all the way to 55 uh, on that panel, and that was extremely important. But once the panel made those recommendations, then they brought them. Uh, we had the, the Assistant Secretary of uh, Manpower and Reserves, uh, one of his deputies, Mr. Williams, sat on that chair, and they said, here's the recommendations, here's how the panel voted, and we accepted all the recommendations. I didn't go in and go, nope, don't want that, don't want this. Is uh, I trusted that the panel had the appropriate information. We brought in the appropriate um uh, you know, experts to explain why these things were important, and we had soldiers on the panel. So when they brought them to us, it was fairly easy for me to go, I trusted that the panel had the right ideas, and then I just accepted what they had taken to me. If, if Did I you want to add something? Sure. Add to, to what the SMA is saying, just um, uh, as, as leading up to this event, I saw a lot of questions on social media about, you know, who's making the decisions uh, for this panel, and just to kind of add, um, to what the SMA was saying. Uh, there was representation from operations, operational support, and force sustainment. To even include you know, females who were in combat arms, MOSs, um, to really speak to their experiences and how some of these changes will impact their ability to perform their job. But most importantly, some of the points that they were driving home is to, 
to feel inclusive with their their squad, the the individuals that they're serving and training with. And I will tell you, um, those individuals who were handpicked by their leaders to come in and provide that information was was really critical in helping the the uh, panel understand the decisions and how important they were going to make. And the SMA mentioned two-star generals all the way down to um, sergeants. And they wore civilian clothes so that every person in there um, didn't have to worry about the rank of the other individual. Every person had an equal voice to voice their concern on each topic that was presented to them. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, so the first change we're going to announce today is the earrings. SMA, let's, let's hear, <laughs> let's your hear about it. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it was really um, another reason why I keep going back to the panel is another reason is, you know, I'm just going to be honest. If you'd asked me before a panel, I'd said, no, why do we need earrings? We hadn't had them. So, and that's why, I mean, I trusted the panel had a good deliberation and they brought and says, hey, we want earrings. And I said, well, I trust the panel. And uh, the panel says this is their recommendation. Um, and they voted and everybody had an equal vote. We're not going to talk specifically on, you know, how the votes came out. Um, but this, they, the majority ruled, and this is one of those things. And our soldiers said, hey, we're going to wear earrings. Yeah, we wanted to do this. Uh, we're not going to do it in combat operations. Um, but if you want to put some earrings on, I think there will be more guidance to come out. But we, when we even had the deliberation about how we're going to implement this, you know, is the helmet on or is it off? You know, if the helmet's on, you may take the earrings out. But I think this is really good for our Army. And if you want to wear earrings in a combat uniform, wear the earrings. Now, I know we're all excited about the earrings. I am especially, but we're not going to move to it yet. We're going to wait till the Alarite come out, right, Sergeant Major Clark and Sergeant Major Sanders? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me just drive it home again. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, somebody out there right somebody now has the earrings. in their hand. In my, Sergeant Alvarez, in, in my motion. office, she's like, Sergeant Major. So, uh, yeah. I think that still applies, thanks. Yes, 30 days from now, 670-1 comes into effect, mm -hmm. and then an Alarac uh, will follow um, after that, authorizing um, the, the wear of earrings. So, for whatever reason, let's say the Alarac gets held up in process, you know, wait for the Alarac before you, you know, decide to don your earrings. That's very key. Yeah, it's a very important note that the grooming standards are separate from AR 670-1. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we could, Sergeant Major Clark, just explain uh, why those two things were separated. Absolutely. Um, so one, to, to make sure that we don't cause confusion. Um, as mentioned, we've been working uh, with the changes for 670-1 since June of 2019. And so the process for publishing a regulation, it's a very deliberate process and it's that way for a reason, but it takes time. So as the regulation is going through that process, decisions are still being made on the wearing appearance of the uniform. And in order to insert any of those decisions in there, we would have to start the process all over for that regulation. So to avoid delaying that regulation any further, we have to wait for it to be published before we can release any additional guidance. If we were to release an Alarac for grooming standards prior to the regulation coming out, what would happen is once the regulation is published, it would then supersede the Alarac, and then you would lose your ability to wear your earrings. So we have to be very deliberate and strategic in how we roll the information out to ensure that we don't um, have basic policy fratricide. All right, we've got our first question from Facebook. Uh, so that didn't take very long. So Sergeant Major Sanders, I'll give this to you. Can you uh, explain the uh, restrictions on the earring first? And then the second one, uh, was there any discussion? Is this a gender, gender neutral uh, standard? Can you uh, just discuss the uh, man versus woman uh, as related to earrings? Don't make me sound bad with a man versus woman. <laughs> uh, so I'll, yeah, I'll definitely start with the, uh, the guidance. So. Uh, the, as far as the, the guidance right now for the you know, Army Service Uniform for the dimensions of the earring, it's still the same for the Army Combat Uniform. The only difference is female soldiers will not wear pearl earrings in the Army Combat Uniform. You can still wear pearl in the service and dress uniform, but not the Army Combat Uniform. And you will not wear earrings in a tactical training se you know, setting or a combat deployment. As far as the gender neutral, that's a, a negative at this point. Right now, it's strictly for female soldiers. Um, can't say what happened in the future, but for now, it's for female soldiers. All right. Are we ready to move on to the, the next one? If, if I may, just, okay. um, to kind of add 
some of the why behind. So as we discussed, um, there were several uh, medical professionals brought in to brief the panel on different things, one being a dermatologist, the other one being a uh, behavioral health specialist. And uh, I will tell you, learned quite a bit from uh, those individuals on how certain uh, policies that we had in place impacted um, female soldiers. So as we are trying to get our arms around, um, you know, the corrosives in the army, things like suicide and sharp, um, we learned some different things that may impact female soldiers um, in reference to being a female in a masculine army. And, you know, our attrition rates for females are higher than males. And as we started looking into those things, we realized that the need to feel as a female and be a soldier at the same time, earrings kind of help bridge the gap in soldiers who want to serve and be soldiers, but also want to feel like a female at the same time. So that was very educational to us and how some of that can impact individuals um, who may be feeling depressed because they don't feel um, like a female. That played a very large part in helping educate the panel when they made their decisions. All right, we, we do have a lot of topics, so we'll keep the conversation moving. Uh, as, it, as it pertains to uh, women and women who are in, the, in ser serving our country and uh, the ways that we're be becoming more inclusive, one of the things that came up was minimum hair length. Uh, you know, we saw this as we uh, opened up Ranger School uh, to two women uh, and seeing, you know, if, if they didn't make it through while well, they were leaving Ranger School and now they were out of regs. So uh, let's do Sergeant Major Sanders, if you'll, I'm sorry, no, Sergeant Major Clark, back to you to discuss uh, the uh, minimum hair length for women. Um, absolutely. I'll touch on this and I'll also uh, let Sergeant Major Sanders uh, jump on this. Um, so what we found as we implemented policies such as uh, Soldier 2020, which is basically where we um, uh, be begin to bring females into combat arm MOSs, um, as uh, female soldiers were going through certain training such as Ranger School and decided to shave their head again to be more inclusive with their peers that they were training with, technically they were out of regulation during that time frame in which they were doing it. And so we obviously saw that there was a contradiction between what we um, had in place and really where the Army is going. And um, there really was no rationale on setting a set minimum length um, for the female hair. So the female change or the change in the regulation will now allow uh, females to not have a minimum length requirement for their hairstyle. Yeah, and before it's starting, I, I'll jump mm. on. You know, when you go through ranger school, and I'm sure it may be a little different than when I went, I don't know, 1990. But, um, you know, you know, that was one of the things, you know, be no hair, be no chow, be no sleep. So I happened to be in Bravo uh, Company. And that was just one of their mottos. And imagine if you couldn't do that, um, you know, you weren't like everybody else in the company. So it is really important to be inclusive, to be in a, you know, part of that team. And we shouldn't, you know, punish anybody who says, hey, that's a standard. And why do we have that standard? That's, that was the whole joys of looking into this is that um, we had an opportunity to go, is, it, is that something we need to do? Or why are we doing that? Uh, and, you know, another thing, too, if you look on the slide, too, uh, the, the female soldier down there with her children, she was actually one of the first women to graduate from uh, within West Virginia Army National Guard. And she was one of the ones who brought this topic and, you know, something for us to explore. And at first we looked at it from the realm of, you know, special forces selection, uh, you know, Ranger School. Now that our female soldiers are breaking barriers, but we wanted to take it further. You know, should we just only be for school? It should be for a woman's identity overall. It's a woman's choice to have hair or not. And that's something we really want to get after as well. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. So the next uh, change that we're going to discuss is ponytails. Um, I know there's been changes to the ponytail's hair length and it not having to be encapsulated for a certain length. Sergeant Major Sanders, can you expound on that? For the, uh, the short ponytail? Yes. Correct. Ponytail. Uh, so yeah, the short ponytail, this has been a, been a one that's been up for debate. Like how can you force something out of nothing? Um, you know, if you don't have the texture or length of hair to form a bun, what do you do? So we wanted to say, hey, you know what? It's okay to be able to wear a, a ponytail on the back of your head as long as it's not as wide as the back of your head or it you know, impairs the proper wear of the, your, your headgear. So this is one of those ones that the panel really looked at and said it just makes sense. Why not? I mean, as long as it's you know, professional in appearance and it's neat and well-groomed, why not? So here we are, you know, being able to you know, have an option. And from the, the medical perspective that the dermatologist really put, right now soldiers who are forcing hair to go into a bun is really pulling on the hair, causing hair loss, alopecia, 
And what we want to do, along with diversity and inclusion, but from the medical health and wellness aspect, is how do we make sure we keep our soldiers healthy? How do we go opposite of hair loss? So the best way to do that is to look at an option, and this is our option right here. Now, SMA, we saw a lot on your social media, uh, especially over the block leave. This, this topic is very uh, emotionally charged uh, for a lot of people. Uh, so what, you know, what kind of went into, what were some of the things that you were hearing and, and your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, and this is really, how do you, you know, and I, you know, I had actually a clap. You didn't see it out there, but she, there were people in here clapping for this. So, <laughs> um, you know, and what it's explained to me, how do I go from, if I want, you know, if I want to go from medium to long hair, how do I do that? How do I, and then, you know, why do I have to have my hair in a bun? So, and how do I do that? Sometimes my, the texture of my hair won't allow me to do that. Um, so why wouldn't we have a, you know, a policy that it is a little bit more inclusive based off the texture of my hair. And if I want to go, you know, from a medium hairstyle to a long hairstyle, you have to have some kind of short ponytail or you just, you know, you just had it, and once you cut it off, you can't ever, you know, go from one hairstyle to the other. So I, I think this is really good for the Army. All right, we, we said short ponytails. How about long ponytails? What do we, what, what did the panel come back with on, on long pine? First, what did the panel say originally, Sergeant Major Sanders? And no. then as we came back to that, uh, we'll go SMA to discuss how that evolved. Roger. So initially, uh, you know, the recommendation was to have long pointy tails for female soldiers, not the guys, for female soldiers in all uniforms. And, and I was strictly a, a no, like, hey, keep it in the Army physical fitness uniform only. Uh, but after some talking, you know, some more recommendations were brought up. And this is why there was a benefit of having a very diverse, uh, you know, panel uh, from the combat arms perspective as well, and just soldiers in general. And they were able to look at, you know, effectiveness and, and functionality along with the other, uh, you know, good, you know, nice to haves. And uh, what we looked at was, you know, making this a yes, but under certain conditions. And uh, some of those conditions are, you know, conducting physical training in the Army combat uniform, utility uniforms. And also when, you know, you're, you know, wearing certain kind of helmets, like a CVC helmet or advanced combat helmet, to be able to have the option for taking your, your bun down in a ponytail and tucking that hair in the back of your, you know, your, your neck down in your Army combat uniform coat in order to be able to put that helmet on so it can sit mm -hmm. without it impairing your vision or making it uncomfortable when you're trying to execute you know, effective training or combat operations. And for me, I thought um, this is where it really, you know, it's part about readiness. And, and everybody that's ever shot their rifle, you know, especially, you know, having something additional on the back of your head, push that helmet down over your eyes while shooting a rifle is miserable. So, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's males and females. And when somebody said, well, imagine, Sergeant Major, you got a bun on the back of your head and that's actually, you got your, you know, your combat vest on, then you have a bun and that's also pushing down. So to me, it may, you know, it would help our readiness to undo that. And then how do you, how would you wear your helmet if you're an aviator when that thing goes all the way over if you had long hair it's just it's impossible uh if you had it in a bun it just doesn't work so we just made our you know policy align with that we're not going to have everybody's going to have a long ponytail if you have long enough hair and you're going to put it in a bun but if you're on the range or somewhere like that and you need to to be more effective and more ready as a soldier let's do it so and that's that's why we fully supported this one Right. And I want to stay with hair. So Sergeant Major Clark, uh, let's discuss uh, one of the regulations was uh, about different hairstyles and only being allowed to have one hairstyle on the head. Can you talk about the discussion that was had and the decision that we made uh, on that topic? Yes. Yeah, so um, for under the previous guidance, um, you were only authorized to wear one hairstyle. Um, but as we, if we probably go back and look at some soldiers that we've all had at some point in time, we probably realize that they probably had multiple hairstyles at once, whether they had locks and then had it pulled into a bun or into a braid or a case, and it still presented a professional um, look and it didn't interrupt good order and discipline um, of the soldiers. So um, the panel took a look at this and as you can see some of the imagery that is being broadcast and as you look, um, these soldiers have multiple hairstyles um, and it doesn't interfere with their ability to properly wear their headgear. They still have a professional appearance. Um, there was no reason not to go with the recommendations of the panel to allow the multiple hairstyles in uniform. Mm -hmm. Now, Sergeant Evans, um, if you could just kind of explain for the group just some of the different things, the options that, that women 
uh, now have from your own experience uh, dealing with this issue? Sure. I mean, uh, you can have braids and put it in a bun. You can do a braid to the side if you have shorter hair to the front or to the back. So you can wear multiple hair hairstyles at once, and it does make it easier when trying to adhere to the standard and being able to, to give you more options, especially if you have longer hair. Um, it just gives you more options to adhere to the standard. So I think that was a win for us. Uh, so, Sergeant Major Clark, um, what can you tell us about the new changes to um, makeup and, and nails? All right, so uh, with fingernail uh, polish, uh, soldiers will uh, be able to, female or uh, female soldiers will be able to uh, wear fingernail polish as long as the colors are not uh, ex extreme or eccentric um, and, you know, it presents a professional appearance. And, you know, I'll allow Sergeant Major Sanders to kind of add a little bit more to that. Uh, yeah, so this was a good one too, and this is one of those ones we made uh, gender neutral in a sense. So we authorize uh, male soldiers to wear clear nail polish. Um, and just to kind of jump a little bit more on what Sergeant Major Clark said, it, you know, you just got to make sure when it comes to that professional and we say these extreme colors, you know, that's not, your, you know, your yellows, your blues, your purples, you know, those are definitely the unprofessional extreme colors that we don't want. Um, and that's something, you know, as we come out with the Alarac, we'll not necessarily tell you what color you can wear, but we'll put it in the frame of the, the category of acceptable colors uh, that, you know, represent professionalism. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, next topic we want to get to is on highlights. Who wants to, who wants to talk about highlights? So uh, I guess I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> I would did, talk about it, but, you know, my highlights... Uh, <laughs> This is it. I'm just happy I have hair. Roger so. that. That's always a good thing. Always a good thing. So uh, right now in the regulation, you know, it, it, hair dyes are already authorized, uh, but we want to take this further. You know, hey, you know, female soldiers, even male soldiers, they want to, you know, have an opportunity to, you know, kind of jazz it up a little bit, you know, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's part of your identity. And, and some people like myself, you know, you want to hide the grays. I don't hide them. I'll let you see them. Uh, but some, you know, want to, you know, maybe hide the gray or some want to have the, the natural appearance. And, you know, that we really talked a little bit about what is a natural color. And that natural color is not your natural color. It's a natural color that can be worn, you know, for your highlights as a uniform blended color. Uh, so this was one we really looked at, you know, from the, the psychological realm of how do we increase productivity. And, and when you do that, it's really building upon the identity of the soldier. And that's something we really looked at in the recommendation of highlights. You mentioned yourself. So are you, are you implying that, that this highlight standard is gender neutral? It is gender neutral. So Roger men that. and women both uh, are authorized a uh, uniform blend of a, natu a natural color, not their natural color. Roger. Correct. You know, what, when they brought this to me, was for, um, part of it was, you know, I had someone say, well, I've probably been wearing highlights. I just didn't know that was not allowed. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, part of this was what, what's actually already out there that maybe not everybody understood what the standards were in the beginning. And then that's why that whole panel and how we brought experts in and go, this is a highlight. And, and you know, I wasn't in the panel, I wasn't on the panel, but that's what they explained to me was like, here's what this is. And this is why the panel recommend recommended that. And a lot of times uh, some of our soldiers were getting highlights and maybe didn't even know that that was part of the regulation and the, the leaders didn't know that's a different issue. But uh, just kind of match what we're already doing um, for our soldiers and say, yeah, this is, this is allowed. All right, gentlemen, a lot of questions coming in. Again, if you have questions here in the room, uh, you're welcome to stand up and come to the microphone. That signals to us that we have a question here in the room. But from Facebook, uh, we've discussed a lot about uh, women's hair and the different options that they have. Uh, how about uh, men's hair? And specifically, when we start looking at things like uh, twists and uh, locks and hard parts, afros, things like things like that, are there were, th were there any discussion on uh, options that men have? On the, on the panel, the, uh, there weren't any at this time. Uh, we just really just kind of stuck with the recommendations. The panel didn't delve off into that realm, uh, but you know they did. You know, want to ensure that the female soldiers that have a low cut can, you know, have it tapered and have the hard part. That, that current standard is in the regulation as it stands right now of having a part where your hair would normally part or if your hair doesn't part naturally, being able to put that hard part. Okay. But at this time, nothing, uh, no conversation that was had during the panel. 
Right, and so we know that words matter, right? And that's something that was addressed in the, the new standards. So uh, you know, women versus female or uh, offensive words like Mohawk, Fu Manchu, Dreadlock. Uh, what were some of the conversations, uh, SMA, if you wouldn't mind uh, discussing uh, about some of those terms that maybe are antiquated or, or offensive uh, in today's culture? back to you know really a larger thing diversity inclusion and look at all our rigs and not just 670-1 do mm -hmm. I, is our verbiage right uh, are we being offensive and we don't even know that that has a negative connotation over time and there were some things you know why would we say mohawk why would we say fu manchu why would we why would we say that so just take that language out and say is it in good order and discipline for our soldiers and I think that's appropriate and this is part of a bigger where we look at those are those microaggressions those things that we were saying that maybe we didn't know uh, were offensive that we need to be aware of that so I think this is appropriate um, to stick to these are the standards this is what we're doing and and kind of get some of that language appropriate. Roger. And on top of the, uh, those words, you know, eccentric and faddish are normally mm -hmm. used as weaponized wording. Uh, there was one th comment that psycho psychologists really brought up during the panel that those words are often used uh, for a certain demographic. And what we want to do is we want to utilize our lexicon and our vocabulary. There's many more words in a dictionary that we can use to describe and replace those words. So eccentric and faddish are definitely those two words we're going to try to get rid of as, as well as, you know, clarify, you know, what do we mean by professional appearance? That is such a, you know, a subjective term is just kind of thrown out there, you know, professional appearance. Well, what is that? And that's what we want to define by, a, you know, a well, clean grooming appearance. And so that's what we're planning to get after, too, as we remove and replace uh, the appropriate wording. And, Sir Major Sanders, uh, the panel did decide on updating imagery for the AR and the DAPM. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how it's going to illustrate the new changes? Roger. So, uh, as you all know, in the, in the current regulation, that's just some outdated, I can't even think of the time frame of when that artwork was done. No, not to the artists who did the artwork at that time, but you know, we're changing. Um, it's not enough to equip leaders. It's not a, enough to equip us on what right looks like and what wrong looks like. And, and I think you know, with the generation we are now, we want more information and we deserve more information. Mm -hmm. So the intent behind updating the imagery, um, more examples, and we actually, you know, we're conducting round two of our photo shoot tomorrow to help get after, you know, giving more imagery, more examples. Uh, it really just update, bring it up to the times, and hopefully this is an evolving thing as revisions keep going. Uh, we can keep updating this thing to be more of a current uh, reflection of what we're talking about in regard to gu uh, guidance and Army policy. Great. Sir Major Clark, uh, any other thoughts on, on the changes? What kind of sticks out to you? What do you see as, as maybe the, the biggest shift uh, culturally for our Army? Um, so some additional changes that will come out in further guidance um, that will not be in 670-1, but again, will be published in a, in a separate Alarac message um, is diacritical name tags in the Army Service uniform. Um, this was a, a big uh, change to allow for those who have hyphens in their names, um, who have an accent on their name. Um, as you realize, some of those spellings or unique spellings of the names are part of your identity or who you are, your culture, where you come from. And so to allow those um, to be worn on the Army Service uniform um, with your nameplate, I think is, is a big part of our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts um, with the soldiers. All right. Uh, once again, I'll remind you, we are trying to take as many questions as we can online. We're uh, pulling those in right now. Uh, again, if you have any questions here in the room, uh, you're welcome to stand up. Uh, SMA, uh, I guess I'll ask you the same question as, as what we've discussed today. What were some of the things that really stuck out to you? Well, I think, uh, I think the biggest one for me is uh, the earrings and the short ponytail and the long ponytail. It's just kind of, you know, it's really progressive on how soldiers, you know, can't identify with you know who they are and I think that's what I really learned in this last year is and I, I was at fault on this I used to say you know we're all soldiers you know I, I just see green what I learned uh, even throughout my myself is that when you say that you don't see me as a soldier um, so that's some of those things we're trying to understand is not only are you a soldier, but there's other pieces of you that are critical that we need to understand as an army. And that's what's important about some, that's why I'm so excited about these grooming standards is that 
you know, some of this is, you know, I need to do better as a person to see the people around me to identify that they may identify with something that I, I don't understand, but we're acknowledging that, that we're going to look at that. And that's why, you know, some of those things that uh, the three I just mentioned are really important to us. Okay. We have another question in from the Facebook Live. Uh, just a little bit of clarification on the ponytail. Is it uh, just a free-flowing or is, our bra is a braid going to be allowed? Uh, Star Major Sanders, do for you want to? For the long ponytail, correct. Roger. For the braided ponytail, if they yep. have to tuck it. Mm -hmm. okay. So Roger. a long single braid will be authorized in when they are wearing the long ponytail? Correct. Okay. Good deal. Uh, next question. Uh, it looks like a lot of these recommendations are significantly um, geared toward women uh, and specifically women of color. Uh, were there any male standards? And I, I kind of think I know what you're getting at on this one, but uh, you know, it does seem like a lot of these new changes are geared toward uh, primarily women of color. Uh, can we just elaborate and explain kind of why this panel specifically focused on those issues, Sergeant Major Clark? Um, so I'll start on on a, a piece of this. Um, so again, as the SMA kind of laid out earlier, uh, these were the topics that were presented um, to us. There is a process that we have where if you have concerns or issues, um, you can uh, send them to the Uniform Policy Office um, for consideration um, to be looked at. So as we looked at these specific ones, um, specifically uh, the short ponytails, uh, part of the issues as the uh, dermatologist briefed to the panel was um, it created alopecia and one third of African American females were impacted by um, that alopecia, but it also impacted um, Asian soldiers, um, uh, Latino soldiers, other demographics as well. So it wasn't geared toward just only um, African American women, it was geared toward just women in general they broke down the hairstyles in a high, medium, and low risk um, to the soldier that basically gave them um, alopecia. And what we found was for soldiers who were transitioning, as we mentioned earlier, from a short um, hairstyle to a long hairstyle, trying to force their short hair into a bun, it put them in the high risk. And so that was one of the reasons why we made that change. Um, it, wasn't it just happened to impact um, uh, one third of African Americans and of course other minority uh, demographics. So it just kind of happened to work out that way based on what the, uh, the problem set that was presented to the panel. But it, it wasn't intentionally uh, designed to go look just for uh, specific demographics to try to improve with. All right, SMA, you know, you know what's coming. You know it was inevitable. Every man in the Army wants to know are we getting the beard? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, we're not. Um, that's not one of those things we looked at. And, um, and uh, I am a man in the Army, so I may disagree that every man in the Army wants a beard. So, um, no, uh, we're not looking at it. But there is already a, an exception to policy for those that have issues with shaving. There's already a uh, profile uh, that you can get. Um, and you can have a beard. There's also religious accommodations, and I'll let uh, Sergeant Major Clark or Sergeant Major Sanders jump in if I miss anything. But there, there is way, but uh, we had not reviewed it, and it was not on the docket, so right now you will not have a beard. Yeah, I, I think that you know, this is a perfect example of what you talk about when we say you can have policy, but it, it needs leadership. The, the policy does have authorizations for beards, and yet Still, we hear stories all the time of soldiers who feel like they still have to shave and they're forced into shaving, uh, even though they have those medical or religious exemptions. Yeah, and the other side of this, uh, you know, for the leaders, if your soldiers have a valid exception to policy, there should be, that's a valid exception to policy. We have to be acceptance. Again, just because it doesn't look like you or act like you doesn't mean it's right or wrong. That's the whole point of being inclusive. And so if there is an exception to policy to have a beard, there should be no leader out there telling a soldier to shave. Uh, we, we have to do better than that. I'm, uh, I'm getting a note that it looks like about a third of our Facebook Live audience dropped off. Uh, <laughs> they said, we're, we're done. done. We're done. Uh, uh, yes. And, and where the famous quote was, if I can't have a beard, I'm just going to get out of the army, so I don't know. I guess uh, 
The, so. We have a great transition program. And Please contact your Soldier for Life well and, representative. And I ask everybody to use it. Uh, I still think we have the greatest army in the world, and we have some great policies. And we're constantly looking at how we can get better. Um, so, yeah. So why now? Why, why is this in, in 2021? Uh, you know, we've had gender integrated units for years. We've had uh, um, desegregated units for decades. Why are we just now looking at some of these policies that, that uh, are affecting and, and becoming more inclusive? So I, I will tell you, um, it may appear like just now, but um, the, the truth is we've been looking at these for quite some time. Um, some of you may or may not be aware of the Army People Strategy, which is approaching its uh, one year anniversary, which gets after how we um, acquire, develop, employ, and retain, you know, our soldiers. And, and in those four lines of effort, you know, we've, we uh, mesh in diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, we've been going through all of the regulations to figure out, you know, how can we improve the standards and policies that we have to make sure that they are fair and equitable for all soldiers and so that we can obviously get the best talent um, in the Army. Um, so if you just take a look at other things like things that we just recently did with temporary promotions, that gets after, you know, uh, disadvantaged individuals. Um, so. Across, and there's more coming. Um, so this is this is just you know we're we're just getting started with all of the different changes to make the army better for you. Um, the chief, the SMA, the secretary are all you know very adamant about people first, and we are trying to show you the action that is being put behind that mantra of putting you as the soldier first through policy. Yeah, and just a caveat, and then I just. I've been in the Army, I think, sometimes longer than dirt. But um, what this, but our Army has changed, and it's going to continuously change. Um, I was on the hair panel when I was a Division Star Major. I sat through the full three days, and I had all the experts come in and explain to me about hair. So we, and we did that in 2015. Um, we didn't have the pony. If you went 10 years ago, there was no ponytails in, in physical fitness or anywhere. So, and we made that change, and now we've got another change. So, change is just um, how the Army runs, and I know some people don't really like that um, because change is hard, and it just, you know, you get set to what we used to do. That, that doesn't, that may not be what we're gonna use in the future. So, these changes, um, I'd say, are just part of the normal progression of the military and how we're trying to be more inclusive. and. Why not? You know, people say, well, why now? And I'd say, well, why not? So when you see something that you would ask uh, that we need to change, bring it up through the appropriate channels or just send it to us. Our Major Clark, use his email right there. <laughs> but, uh, but send it to us and we, we'll take a look at it. I, I, I really trust that uh, our leaders now, we don't look at everything, uh, but we do over time, we look at it. And we're gonna review it again. It's gonna change three years from now or two years from now. There's gonna be something else. We go, oh, we didn't get that right, it's coming. I'm gonna tell you right now, this isn't the end, like Sergeant Clark said. So uh, the change is, is here. Um, we had enough people bringing that forward. We looked at it, we're gonna make those changes, but there'll be more changes um, in the future. Okay, uh, from Facebook, uh, Ali Prescott asks, uh, was there any discussion on 600-9 uh, revisions as part of uh, inclusivity, and, uh, or inclusivity um, or just any discussion uh, within this panel and maybe any other discussion happening? Um, uh, no. <laughs> so this is a grooming standards panel. Right. So there was, a, there was no discussions about 600-9. The only study that we currently have um, on... Um, it's called the Female Elite Warrior, and they're doing that up at uh, Natick, and they, they have all the, the equipment to do the test to say um, for, and they brought in some of those females that uh, went through Ranger School, the one female that graduated through Special Forces, and look at their uh, body style and do we have that correctly. I've also asked, I've already asked TRADOC to go out and see uh, when exactly the last time we studied this and is it time to do another study? I've had enough people ask me and every time I meet, even if it is a grooming standards forum to ask me about it, 
that I've asked TRADOC to go back and uh, do a review and say, when was the last time we actually reviewed the standards? Uh, do we have that uh, correct? So I've got that out. It'll take us some time to, to review that, but I've asked TRADOC to help me out with that. All right, trying to sift through all the facial hair questions. I think we have uh, really hit that one home. Uh, Someone is uh, taking the opportunity here. This is Chief Huddleston uh, from the 82nd. He's watching with his squad. Uh, they wanted to take this opportunity and ask if there were any updates coming to the ACFT. I know it's not the main topic of this, but uh, something that's very on a lot of people's minds. So while we have the opportunity, uh, SMA, would you like to talk about that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, AC, the Army Combat Fitness Test. Uh, we have one. Um, um, change that we haven't rolled out yet. We're just going to make sure that the senior leaders have uh, looked at that and we're calling it 3.0, 3.0. And we'll get, I'm not going to talk about the specifics of that until we make sure that uh, we are moving in the right direction. So there is version three um, that we're coming out with and I'm really excited about that proposal. And most people would go back and look at the National Defense Authorization Act and say, how has that affected the um, the current ACFT and where it says, hey, we have to do an independent review. We've already started the independent review or we've, we've got the idea it's coming. I believe they're gonna meet in March. Then we'll get an update in the beginning of the summer and then the end of the summer. And then the final review is gonna be in December. So right now with the changes of Army Combat Fitness Test 3.0 and the independent review, we still believe we're on track for the APFT, I'm sorry, the ACFT in March of 22. So we still, we still have some time to go. I'd still say hey, fitness uh, counts, so, and I'd ask you all to, to stay on track. It's a good test. We're gonna continue to, to work real hard to get this right. And take it, take the test. Take the, yes, please. <laughs> uh, keep up with your physical fitness, and if you, when in doubt, take the Army Combat Fitness Test. And over time, I think you'll do better. It's really good for your total fitness. So the next question is for Star Major Clark um, and Star Major Sanders. What is, um, how can soldiers make a recommendation or recommended changes to um, AR 670-1 um, and how will those changes be taken into consideration, like uh, future changes? Yes, yeah, so there's, uh, there's multiple ways. Uh, DA Form 2028 is the actual official form uh, to submit to my office directly to myself and Master Sergeant Quintana Mitchell. Um, We'll, we'll definitely take those into consideration. I would ask that you, you make sure this is vetted through your command team and it is endorsed by the commander before it's sent up because it could be something as simple as a grammatical change or something not word or right inside policy or regulation. But there are bigger items that affect the whole Army. And for something of that magnitude, it has to go up uh, you know, through the G1 Sergeant Major to the uh, Sergeant Major and Army, his senior enlisted council, and to Army senior leaders for us to really look at things and, and you know, see how does this positively affect our army, and that's really just to sum up, you know, how something could be as minor or something and just as major as a, something that affects the army. How it would go? But if you have any questions, um, I'm easy to find. Brian.c.sanders on global. Just shoot me an email, and we'll answer it for you. I was brave. <laughs> they, they blew up. <laughs> hey, they, uh, they don't email me anyway. They go, uh, I'd also say, you know, I'm not sure. You know, you have to completely vet a recommendation throughout your chain of command. If you've got something, send it to him. And then we, the senior enlisted council meets every quarter. Every quarter we get together and we come in with recommendations, whether that's 670-1, grooming standards. There's a whole bunch of things we get together and we have experts come brief the senior enlisted council. And at that point, if we think, if the council believes that's, that's a valid, that's actually how you got the panel. So these recommendations were brought to the senior enlisted council. We looked at them and said, okay, if this is really important, you know, what we really didn't want to do is have, you know, us again, because we we're more seasoned people in that room, we want to get the panel. So the, the senior enlisted council got briefed on these recommendations and then we asked for a panel. So anytime you could talk to your senior um, Sergeant Majors in your installations across the globe, or you can send it straight to him and Sergeant Major Sanders has an obligation to bring it to us. We look at it and say, do we need to look at it? And then we'll send those things out for those grooming. And, and that's how you actually got to these recommendations. Given a number of these recommendations or, or these uh, new standards uh, are gender specific, 
Uh, we had a question about the, the ending of the transgender ban and, and allowing transgendered people to come and serve uh, as long as they meet the Army standard. Uh, I, th I think the answer is, should be pretty obvious, but can we just state out there uh, just how these gender-specific standards will impact transgendered soldiers? So I, I would tell you, I think you're, they're referencing the, uh, the guidance that was put out by the Secretary of Defense um, yesterday. So um, what we as the Army are doing now are taking a look at our policy, providing recommendations to the Army senior leaders um, so that we can get a decision on how we are going to support um, the Secretary of Defense's um, guidance on supporting uh, transgender. So there is more to come and more conversations to be held. And then once those decisions are made, we're definitely going to notify the field or how we're going to do our part. Yeah, and I think, uh, just to be clear, I'm, it started with the president when he said, I'm going to sign the executive order and then the SECDEF. But it does take us some time to review the policy. I mean, we had a policy in 2016 that changed. Uh, there was another executive order that was signed by the president at the time, and then we made a change. And so this is, this is a, again, remember I, I, I talked about that change. Change is just how, you know, it's been, every time I've been in the Army for a long time, it just, things change. So um, we've, we're gonna look at that. We'll have to, to adjust or not and see, here's the standard. Did we get that right? And and then what that means. So we got a little bit of work to do. The good news is we've, we've changed several times on this and, and we had a policy. Uh, did we look at it? We're gonna go back and review it and then uh, publish another policy to see, make sure it aligns with what we're doing uh, today. And to be clear, the, the gender specific standards that a soldier will follow will be tied to the gender marker inside the DEERS program. I, I still, I'm, I'm just gonna say right now, you know, Yes, but let's, let's make sure we go back and review the policy that we have. Do we have it right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? And that was, you know, if you were in Deers and that was your gender marker, or if you changed at that point, then you would, you know, that was what we were doing. Um, that's still there. But again, we're going to, like any change, we're going to review it and say, did we have that right? So uh, whatever policy we have, that is still in effect. But that doesn't mean we're not going to look at it. We just got, you know, new guidance from the Secretary of Defense and the President, and it's time to go back and review it and say, okay, to the force one more time, you know, because uh, you know each year people get out of the Army, you know, about sixty thousand at the active component, about one hundred thirty thousand every year leave active guard and reserve every year. So again, we we got the guidance. Um, let's review what the policy is, and then we'll come back out and say, let's review it. Do we have that correct? re-educate the force because that's part of that it's just like this with the grooming standards it's about getting this message out to the force then we say here's what we're going to do and then here's the date that you can enforce the standard you can and move to this instead of um, here's what we think and we believe we've got the guidance and i think i would just ask for a little bit of time for us to review that and put that out one more time great uh we'll do one last question and it's a leadership question so uh is there, this is from Samantha Webb on Facebook, who wants to ask about the phrase commander's discretion. Mm. And, and really this is kind of a leadership point at, you know, how do we, uh, what guidance do, do we have for our leaders when we're saying exercise discretion uh, to make sure that they are getting it right more often than not? Well, I think, you know, specifically for the grooming standards, that's I think what Sergeant Major Clark was trying to say, those, those graphics and you know, 67-1, it's like, I, I, maybe I was drawing those, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not very good. Now my daughter, she's really good, so she would have done much better than I am. But uh, <laughs> we, we need to update that. That helps us with clarity. Mm -hmm. That does help us with clarity. But any time that you feel that uh, maybe we don't have it right in the commander's discretion, there are other levels. That's what's great about the Army. There's other levels can say, hey, I, maybe I disagree. And I, with the way I read this, and then, and you know, what's great about my army, we're allowed to do that and say, hey, can we look at this? And then you either submit the form or you notify us, maybe we don't have that right. But I think it's really important on some of the graphics that Sergeant Major Clark was talking about is to get that out. So we can do better with technology that we have today to help us inform so there's not as much uh, commander's discretion. When you have a very bland piece of paper and it's blank, it's hard because that's where you get, well, I believe it says this. Mm -hmm. If we can get a better graphic 
and it'll help us depict that. I, that's, I believe that's where we're going. And if you think about it, um, you know, every policy doesn't fit every situation in the Army perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we wouldn't have exceptions to that policy. And so there, there are instances where a, a command, a unit, um, can be in a unique environment where there is a gray area um, that may come to what the regulation says. And so the commander's discretion allows them to be able to make a decision, um, obviously probably consulting legal and things of that nature, um, that is best for that organization and those soldiers um, in that situation. Great, thank you so much. And I wanna thank everyone who asked a question. Would like to thank those of you here in the audience who joined us. The slides that you saw today, we're gonna to make sure that we're posting those. Uh, a lot of new, uh, material will be coming out uh, through social media channels, down through uh, the command channels. And uh, the, if I'm not mistaken, these will be, the AR670-1 will be out for the field to review. Uh, 1600 today is what we're looking at on uh, Army Publishing Directorate. Uh, and again, keep in mind that these changes don't come into effect until after that uh, grace period is, is come down. So keep an eye out across all the Army social media channels to find uh, more information, more graphics, more uh, messages, just things to help you as soldiers to know the standard and leaders to set and enforce the standards. So Sergeant Major of the Army, Grinson, would you like to kind of close us out with any parting thoughts? Yeah. I would just like to say thanks uh, to the Public Affairs uh, folks and uh, those that put this together. This is really important for Army. It's, it's important for us to message this. So for those in the audience and those in the, in the online audience, make sure you get this out and say, and voice your opinion and say, hey, what are the things you need to see? And then let us know. Um, it may not come tomorrow, but we, we will do our best to look at those things that we need to do, and I'm really proud of the team for putting this together. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank Sergeant First Class Evans for co-moderating. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and thank everyone for watching. That concludes our event today. Uh, we look forward to uh, the comments that are going to come after this, uh, the the pitchforks and the torches that are <laughs> coming uh, to the, the the Pentagon right now. Uh, no, we'll get through this, and and mm -hmm. so we really appreciate everyone joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.